everybody. Early here for, uh, uh, for weird things. Dustin gave us the raid, so talk to, the, talk to the people while we wait for the guys to get here. What are we doing? It's Monday? It's June. No, it's not. It's not even June. It's July 6th. I should have known. I saw it. Uh, hey, everybody. We're going to start the Weird Things Podcast. If you've never heard it before, if you haven't joined us, it's a, it's a good time. I recommend you join us. Uh, we talk about the science. Uh, we talk about about the science. The, the one science. We talk about science and supernatural. We talk a lot about space stuff. Um... SpaceX and the uh, uh, Blue Origin, all all of those rocket boys. So uh, please stick around. I hope you have a good uh, streaming stream. How's Justin stream? He was doing uh, doing the politics on Monday. Is that is that correct? Well, uh, uh, I hope you had a good one. Uh, apparently, apparently politics going on. Is that uh, is that one Andrew Main on the line? He's working on getting on the line. Okay, well, here we go. We'll see. We'll give him a minute to uh, to log in. Hello, everybody. Um, double check that this thing is online. Hello. Hello. Hey. I hear you. Good. I, I suppose I followed up your hey by hello. <laughs> I just sound like I didn't hear you. <laughs> uh, hello, that's Andrew Main joining us here. Can you uh, can you tap on your mic for me, Andrew? I want to make sure you got the right one. Oh, it's far away from my mouth. Oh. Is this better? Yeah, that's better when you get. Awesome. Yeah. Sorry. Oh no, it's fine. Sorry. Physics. Now it's gonna be close to my mouth as I eat my pizza. Okay. <laughs> uh, Agent of Enigma says PX3 was good today. Well, that's good. That's good. Always. Hello. Is that Justin Robert Young? That's me. Get on the Skype for me, man. There he is. As opposed yeah, to man. Justin Bilbo Baggins Young, who was on the show a long time ago, but we kicked him off. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, one right behind me. One Brian Brushwood. Uh, so, yeah, we'll get started here in just a few minutes, everybody. Uh, uh, uh. Sent you all a little news article I just found five minutes ago. Oh, you did? Mm hmm Well, let me see if I can log into it. Hey, Brian. Yo! Oh, holy shit! Ooh. What? That's a good holy headline. shit! What just happened? Uh, have you ever wanted to pick the brains of Sir Isaac Newton, Mary Shelley, or Benjamin Franklin? You can now kind of thanks to a new experiment by magician and novelist Andrew Main. Oh, yes, the project yes. called AI Writer uses OpenAI's new text generator API to create uh, simulated conversations with virtual historical figures. The system first works out the purpose of the message and the intended recipient by searching the patterns in the text. It then uses the API's internal knowledge of that person to guess how they would respond in their written voice. This has the front page of Reddit written all over it. So, <clears throat> the funny thing is, uh, this was my last, this was my project last weekend. I went out to dinner with some friends Saturday, had the idea, said, oh, I need to make an easier way to kind of interface what we're working on and doing that. Went home, worked on it Saturday night, Sunday, and then had it working Saturday night, but then Sunday refining it. And then ran it by the folks at OpenAI, talked to them about it, you know, about, you know, the how to safely release it and stuff. And then I haven't, I, you know, let a few, you know, people use it to test it. But then, and then all of a sudden, you know, I, I told, I announced it 4th of July. So I'm like, oh, everybody's at home. And so, you know, it made the rounds, already got my first barrage of criticism from like, you know, AI, you know, people, AI critics and stuff. And it was like, like the life cycle is hilarious. So, yeah, very cool, man. That's awesome. Oh, uh, AI writer dot app. Now you can get to it. Very cool. Very cool. Hello, everybody. So, uh, whoops. Check, 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 check. Yeah, you're on. Oh, 
Uh, nope, I turned myself down. There we go. Um, <clears throat> so uh, uh, what is the single best way for us to direct our energies right now? Um, we can talk about it a little bit. It's, 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 a, it's a side project. It's fun. We don't need to spit. I mean, I'm happy we can talk about it for 10 minutes, but I don't, it doesn't need to be the AI writer app show. It's like, I've got a lot more stuff coming in that area, like a lot more. And this was just more of a, hey, this will be a fun kind of thing. You know, I have like, I think there's some OMF, OMG stuff coming, but this is sort of a fun sort of thing. Um, nice. Very I may exciting. have built this weekend's project even. <laughs> yeah, you've been able to turn these around really fast too, which is which is awesome. They're, they're the opening IP, the API is super friggin' adaptive. And if you, once you get, if you step, take a step away from thinking like just a program or working with like a regular, like what's two plus two. And then you start thinking about, I have this person on the other side of the door who's really smart and picking up patterns. Let me slip the pieces of paper and let them go back and forth. And sure. you know, that's just neat. There's a whole developers channel. There's about a hundred, I mean, there's people doing some cool stuff, but I'm watching them slowly get the idea. And they're really brilliant technical people who, you know, not open AI people, but people from the outside have been working AI and you're watching them sort of go, Oh, you know, Ooh, and that's that's fun. That's fun is to see other people go like, yeah, no, this is really cool. Yeah, very cool. We'll talk about that a little bit when we start the show in here in, yep. in a, few, a few moments. Hey, Justin, how is the how is the stream? Good, good. Uh, is that a new shirt? Uh, this is the new logo that was on a shirt. So, um, nice. Hey, yeah. Justin. Yo. I don't want to get, you know, too political or too controversial, especially sure. in the pre-show right before weird things, but um yeah. I think Hamilton's pretty good. Uh yeah, you know, I watched the Disney Plus had a had a great night July 4th with the fireworks of Oakland in 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 the background, watched it on the roof. Um I've got Hamilton thoughts. It's a very he only well bought constructed... he only bought and sold slaves. He only bought and sold slaves. He didn't keep them, Justin. Okay, <laughs> so just put it I, away. Well, beyond beyond that, uh, look, as a history nerd, I'm excited to see any kind of representation of history in a fun and exciting way. I think the more you read and or know about the founding fathers, it's kind of puzzling that. Hamilton is the guy that they make the like big hero. Um uh, uh yeah. I mean, it's I think it's revolutionary for a lot of different a lot of different reasons. And uh, uh I think it's great. I think you could have randomly chosen anybody from that time period and with the quality of Lynn Wendell as a songwriter and everything else that went into it. You know, we could we could be going, you know, you know, the Penn family, you know, who are kind of awful, you know, yeah. like we could be like just cheering, you know, you know, Manassas, yay! You know? I, 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 will, I will say that the consensus of our viewing on Saturday is that, uh, man, when that camera gets really close to everybody, that cast is electric. And then there's the guy who wrote the play. <laughs> Like like Lin, Lin-, Lin- Manuel's performance next to David Diggs and and uh, Leslie Odom that like you look at that and you're like oh my god like you look, like David Diggs is like oh my god this guy this guy's a star you can now see why he's he's gotten the most kind of like acting sort of like boost out of it uh and you know apparently did did you know that Lin Manuel whenever there was a big dignitary visiting to see Hamilton, any big famous person, that he would let the understudy play the role. Oh, really? I think, yeah. I think because he knew the the part, like, he he deserves all the credit in the world for creating this entire thing. And and I think he acquits himself well, but like, uh, man, when, when the camera is so much closer, you're like, oh, these, all these people are stars and, one person wrote the play. But I think 
the fact that he let the understudy do it is a pretty magnanimous kind of thing too, though. I mean, mm -hmm. I, that would be that. I, yeah. I, I, and I think it's cool to be that multi-talented. I'm in awe. But, I mean, 150% because you're playing at a really, really high level. If you look at what some mm. of the other people have gone on to do. Why not? Why not 200%, Justin? Why are you holding back on us percentages? Uh, I, I, uh, I will issue my, my multi tweet thread apology. Henceforth. Uh, all right. So, uh, what are, what are we waiting on? Um, I don't know. I'm ready to go. Andrew, how about you? Go. Uh, oh, no. okay, so yeah. Well, right, right. I mean, mm. Cheesy crust. Mm. Mm. Also, do you have your AC on? Are you able to pop that off for us? I'm going to turn it off. Thank you. I'm going to stop for you. Don't worry. I'll say I watched the opening number this morning and thought it was cool uh, and then turned it off when they started just sing speaking. I was like, okay, I'll, I'll, I'm not my, <laughs> that's entirely not my thing. I'm just not in a, in a, interested. They're pretty good about people talking. Like, like no, no, no. Uh, like, I mean, that's, that's a problematic trope uh, in all of Broadway musicals and like they sort of gave the middle finger to that entire conceit. Like it's like song ends and then we're going to do bad acting for a little bit. And then the next song will begin. <laughs> like they waste mm -hmm. no time. Uh, I, I, I thought they did pretty good in that regard. Yeah. Okay. Welcome to Broadway things. <laughs> I, I, I really am not like in, in the musicals at all. So I don't, I don't, I, that's cool to hear that it's a subversion, I guess. Yeah, I remember going to see La Boheme. I'm like, of course she's like got pneumonia. Her house had got no roof, you know? Like, it's, the suspension disbelief was lost on me. All righty. You guys ready to do this? I'll sit here. Ready. Yep. All right. Let's I'll do it. Catch you in in three, two. Hello, and welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Justin Robert Young. Hello, Fred. Mr. Brian Brushwood. It's hot. It's hot, but I'm here. It's fine. Don't worry about it. Your trooper man, Mr. Bryce Castillo. Hey, everybody. That's me. Gentlemen, if I were to ask you what would be the coolest thing you could see, if I said, let's capture an image of one thing, one beautiful thing, what would you want to see? To go viral, to go like, oh my God, this is the thing I wanted to see. I didn't know I needed to see, but now I'm glad I saw it. Uh, I would say hard. a cracked open hole in the middle of the moon that led to a quadruple spiral of crystals, the likes of which humanity had never seen before. That is strangely specific, Brian. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, if it's not a spiral, would... what if it's just pointing down? No deal. For Brian, he's like, nope. I asked. I specifically said spiral. No deal. Hold firm. These ones on are like sarlacc Brian. pit teeth, you know. Yeah, yeah I mean, mm. I don't know. That'd be all right. But it's like, if 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 I wanted that, I would go to Golden Corral. Yeah, pu. <laughs> no spiral or none. That's that's uh, that's that that's the ask. Uh, I, I would say uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, something underwater, like like a full big like high resolution picture of one of these like crazy squids that we ain't never seen in a spiral. Mm. Uh, That's cool. Yeah. That's cool. It's yeah. Fun. Next to a crystal fun. spiral that fell off the moon and came in and then fell in the ocean. See, now we're back in business. I'm I, I, <laughs> my money's back out. Good. Bryce. What about you? Um, uh, uh, oh man. You know what? I would love just to see a really high resolution would be like of DNA. Right? Can we Ooh. have we seen DNA? Are you able to just like visualize DNA? I'm assuming we can't. And well, the way that we use it is there's uh, crystallography was the way we'd use to visualize DNA, and that was sort of like how we were able to figure out what it was was you know basically using the you know the, a form of picture taking using crystals or crystallizing it. But oh. there are 
but there are new forms of optics that are actually because the problem is it's like the, the photons that you would bounce off of the the individual atoms would be just these waves would be too big to capture but we do now have ways to perhaps capture that image so that is a thing that's an, an area of research actually trying to do that because um maybe at some point bryce yes oh, cool and those are kind of a spiral and just all that stuff ah there's a theme there uh i don't have any of that for you oh. how about how about a how about a video though of a majestic bird flying through the sky ah birds i've seen it all the time and where do they fly guess what 100 percent, always in the sky so we got a bird that's majestic congratulations that's all birds where is it flying in the sky congratulations that's all birds there's no way whatever i'm about to see can possibly impress me Although, good point by the way, let's move on to our next story yeah. Uh, uh, smash smash cut to a penguin uh, uh, on his phone. Hashtag not all birds to Brian's <laughs> statement that they're flying in the sky. <laughs> Wait, what? What is this? So this was a viral I mean, clip. I'm assuming this is the same viral clip uh, that you're leading us to talk about, Andrew. I'm sure you guys have seen this, right? Nope. I have not, no. Wait. <laughs> this is a bird that has a fish and is flying around just oh. showing off its fish. Not quite a fish. Let's take another look at that pass, at that first pass. Is that a shark? <laughs> is that a like... bird shark? So wait, a bird is just that a bark? snatched this shark up off the... The shirt. <laughs> wait, so I have so many questions about this. How big is that oh bird? Oh my God, How that is How big definitely... is that shark? Uh, well, first of all, uh, uh, the, the shark Bryce. was taken from the shore. So this is a bird shore shark stealing bird shark. No, cut the video. It's not a spiral crystal on the moon. It's none of these things. It's just, sorry. I'm sorry. I mean, there is DNA in there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, so wait, so what, what, are, what are the details here? Uh, I guess somebody, apparently, again, somebody's at Myrtle Beach with their camera and they happen to see a video, their phone or whatever, and there is a bird. And we don't know if it's a shark or if it's just a fish that's very shark-like, but this bird went in and swooped and picked this thing up. And the shape of the, the amazing thing, you haven't seen this video, the the shape of the fish makes it look like it's much bigger. It looks like one of the, you know, the eagles yeah. from Lord of the Rings just swooped in there and picked up like a big shark. Or one of the eagles from the band, the Eagles. Like, they, they look very yeah. big. Brian, it's not the Eagles, it's Eagles. <laughs> Sorry. God. Every time. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's hilarious. Uh, that is amazing and creates a very complicated series of thoughts. We, we were talking about um, on, I believe it was the Night Attack After Show, about like uh, uh, what, uh, somebody having a uh, profane uh, uh, statue in their front lawn and the local hoa wanted to take it down but it's like what if you made it more profane but also it was carved out of the living tissue of a tree that took years and years and years to make so it was it it, it depicted let's say actual sexual congress between uh venus and zeus but it was a very rare tree so at what point does your environmentalism trigger uh overcome your grossness trigger and uh oh are we are we launching your new business brian brushwood's dirty bonsai now oh, or is that <laughs> let me get a let me get a pen hold on <laughs> hold on wait brian's got to register a web address yep <laughs> <laughs> this is bonsai b-o-n-b-a-n i'm sorry uh, uh dude that's crazy so this was just yeah. just a random uh, uh i guess so so it, it, the shark is smaller so like like when when you first glance at it, I think you you do think of it as like jaws, and so therefore the bird has to be massive. Yeah, I I feel sorry for like imagine somebody's on the beach who's terrified of sharks, and they're like, you know, the mom's like, don't worry, we're not going to go in the water. You're fine. You're safe here. Yeah, <laughs> and looking up and seeing this. I know. Yeah, because now it's like a pilot to bombardier situation. That that bird just might get bored and drop a shark hat on someone. There is a brief yeah. moment in this video where it looks like you're looking at a single creature with two heads, you know, like it's about to, yeah. uh, uh, what, what's the name of that, uh, company that, that, uh, launches rockets with a double mast, uh, airplane. Oh, the Paul Allen one. Yeah. 
uh uh yeah straddle launch yeah 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 that's uh looks yeah i mean you know wonder like maybe it was a cooperative thing you know <laughs> the birds flying over hey i can make one of your dreams come true really yeah whoa this is amazing yeah i think that's celebratory flailing here in the back half of this video <laughs> Turn, <laughs> turns out nature is just as into the the power of the collab as youtubers are well people see me swimming but you know what they've never seen and then yeah, rick, rick poor... smith jr shows up and throws cards and hits him or something <laughs> Yeah, you think that like the fish is swimming along, thinking like, "All right, no big sharks in the area. I think it's, today's going to be a good day." I mean, what's the most crazy thing that could happen? <laughs> and then, ah! <laughs> You're 500 feet above, you know, the earth, flying through the air, probably very confused, very confusing. <laughs> that shark was like this close to retirement. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting too old for this. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, there you go. Flying sharks. Finally, that's what 2020 needed was flying sharks. So. Well, look, that might seem out of reach to you that you in your life would ever in person see a, uh, a bird pick up a shark and fly through the sky. But you want to know what, what, what is within reach, either your phone or your computer, where you can go to patreon.com slash weird things and support this show. So if you go to patreon.com slash weird things, you can get your custom RSS feed. You always get the after things show uh, as soon as uh, possible. You uh, make sure that you support the three of us or four of us getting here each and every week, talking science, talking all the news of the weird for you weekly. Patreon.com slash weird things. Yeah, man. Turns out the question between eagle versus shark, the answer is yeah. Both. Yeah. Why not both? Winners <laughs> all. So there was an announcement today that our uh, Harvard is going to go online only for 2021. Have you seen this? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, still $50,000 uh, uh, to go to Harvard uh, uh, per, per year. So, uh, you know, I'll tell you what, that's a pretty expensive Udemy class. I <laughs> feel like this is a genie that nobody could put back in the bottle because like uh my kids have already been doing at school or school learning at home and uh turns out that outside of you know four or five hours of extra daycare they only do about 90 minutes of learning and uh my eldest daughter like already figured that out because she would have two to three classes per day they would be one-on-one sessions and then she would spend four to five hours just, you know, in the common room getting her work done. Uh, and nowadays, I feel like a lot of people are are waking up and figuring out like, uh, yeah, that's about how much school you're really paying for. Yeah, it's a very interesting, you know, development because, yeah, the there's a lot of people that understand like you do homeschooling the value how to do it and i've have i have a couple friends who are homeschooled and they're some of the most capable people i know because you know the, the perception of homeschooled is somebody sitting like in you know some kitchen in the middle of nowhere and you know being you know read from the bible all day and that's it and no friends but the homeschooled kids i know are extremely socialized they have they have groups they do all sorts of outings and stuff you know i've gone to birthday parties where like way more people showed up there than i ever showed up at mine which may say more about my social skills but they have spent a lot of time doing stuff. You know, there's a park in Florida where uh, they used to go walking that was pretty close to me. And you have a couple of days a week, a bunch of these homeschool kids would all be there doing activities. And so there's a lot to be said for that. And the ability to sort of adapt curriculum and share sort of the responsibilities with other parents. And going beyond that at the college level now, when, I mean, yeah, like, like, you know, is saying the, if if you say, oh yeah, I went to Harvard, you know, to, you know, the twenty twenty one onward or whatever, it's going to be different than saying before because you're not going to have the same interactions with your teacher. A big part of Harvard, the reason you go to Harvard is kind of your friends you make. You know, look at you know, part of the reason Facebook happened was because of putting these incredibly talented people together in that environment, and these things happen. And I think you lose a lot of those aspects of serendipity. And I think. Who's to say, you know, somebody doesn't just get some really great teachers and some thinkers and start a completely online school and say, oh, yeah, we've got 10 Nobel laureates. We've got this, whatever. 
Justin, you, create a new thing. you and I have thoughts about this. Mm-hmm. Would, uh, would, would you like me to go first or you? <laughs> well, you, you go ahead. You, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll back you up. But, well, but you, yeah, you I go. mean, basically, uh, um, yes, I understand there's something delightful about being part of a cohort at a time where you're discovering yourself. You're also discovering the thoughts of history's greatest leaders and thought leaders and so on. And, uh, and, and it's no accident that folks who date in college tend to be the ones that marry each other all that stuff, blah, 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 blah. However, uh, when I make a list of all the most successful people I could think of, uh, financially speaking, uh, or even innovation speaking, very rarely do they finish college. Um, uh, and, and Justin and I were uh, musing around, it must have been about five years ago, saying like, what would it look like to have a program that gave you the college experience without the college? because so much of the college experience is dumb. It's dumb that we sort people by their names and then arrange them in uh, miniature clubhouses two by two. It's dumb that their classes are, you know, rando. It's, it's, uh, and then meanwhile, we look at a, an Andrew Main who is busy off, you know, sailing the high seas at that exact same moment, learning from the finest minds at the top of their game and learning uh, uh, real life lessons about how to interact and meet with other people that would later lead to the creation of, of novels and television shows and so much other stuff. Um, I don't know, college, uh, having said all that, uh, uh, I'm thankful for my experience of college, but also college. Eh, I don't know. I all right. So uh, uh, where I tend to kind of draw the line here is I don't think that college is good or bad. I think it's unreasonably expensive. Correct. Um, and and I think that there is a line for which was crossed. You know, sometime in the last couple decades, where the 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 worth of the the diploma itself began to become eclipsed with the the student debt that was kind of like hung around the people that were getting it um and the fact that you're not able to you know declare bankruptcy on it blah 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 uh what i think andrew uh, brought up is a fascinating idea of saying like all right well uh let's understand that I like an online school cannot do what Harvard can do for you physically. Like Harvard is a very expensive institution. It's a very exclusive institution. It also is a pathway into tremendous wealth and influence. It's, it's like, like a, a, a secret code word. Like you say those words and all of a sudden there's a lot of stuff you don't have to worry about. I, I was very, very, when I went to Syracuse, I wound up finding a place where there were a lot of self-starters that, you know, were from decent families that went on to do very interesting and, and exciting things. If I had not found that niche there, though, I would just have a Syracuse degree, which would, you know, buy me the ability to go into a sports bar and and see somebody else in Syracuse gear. And we would both know the same football references, right, or, or basketball references. Um, Harvard is a different animal. Harvard is where you get a lot of people that you can socially connect to, but let's take that away and let's say, all right, um, maybe you can go to Harvard. Maybe you can't, uh, uh, in general, the biggest pre-qualifier to that is that you're from a rich or powerful family, or you are uh, from a family that is sending you to the same preparatory schools where rich and powerful people send their kids or went themselves. If you are to then say, look, maybe we can take an even more star-studded lineup of tele-educators. Uh, and maybe to Brian and I's point, what, what Brian and I thought of, uh, you know, was like, okay, let's also give you a social calendar of things that you should be doing and experiences you should be going on physically that this could create a more enriching experience. And I think that... Uh, uh, you know, you are, I, I see tremendous uh, 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 promise in, in both of what you guys said. Number one, 
uh, Andrew, the the thought, the idea that this could be something that the educators would want to be involved in, and could be something that could be a very significant money maker. Uh, and and Brian, you're saying that like, hey, look, the 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 genie's out of the bottle on this. Like the the longer we go, uh, with the idea that like, hey, life is not about like let let's let's really shave down exactly what the day's lessons are going to be. Let's pare them down because uh, it's, you know, we're now out of this idea that like, well, you're here for an hour, so we're going to pad this hour however we can uh, and, and just get to like less and less and less. And like, I, I do think that there's going to be a value readjustment in the minds of parents and the minds of kids and uh, uh, just the ability that we've known for a very long time that all these tools are online. You can go and, and, and create whatever you want easier than it's ever been in the history of, of humankind. You know, it also opens up the possibility of that you could be a really good professor. And like, I've taken, I've taken like a lot, I've taken a few online courses and stuff and I've done stuff like Harvard extension school and stuff where like when there's like something I'm really curious about and want to learn. And you might take that and it actually might be a professor of philosophy from Dartmouth who teaches it. You know, they're full, the regular full year they're, they're, you know, Dartmouth, but during the summer they do an online course. Well, it's like Harvard. And I think that's kind of neat is you could have like three, you know, you could have, you could be a professor. You could teach it like three different online schools and stuff. I'm, I'm excited about the idea because I could see like somebody, a known figure, somebody we respect or somebody like that saying, Hey, we're going to do, we're going to get some of the best teachers and we're going to create an entirely online thing. That's going to be a fraction of a Harvard degree, but we promise you the education quality is better. And we're going to have a really interactive way because like I said, the thing that the value of, I look at like a Harvard thing is one putting that name Harvard which get, opens up doors, but the real the real value that lasts you the rest of your life is the network. The network you build from you, when you go to when you're in a really good program with people who are like minded, and that's the thing I feel like I missed out on, you know, in a very non traditional path. But you know, when I you know some of my friends though for the longest time though were people I had met just taking you know random courses and stuff. So you know, take that away. What do you have? Just a name. Yeah. And a big bill. I, I'm 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 yeah. feeling. Uh, complicated feelings right now because um, my eldest, uh, you know, she uh, currently goes to a private academy where she just only meets her teachers, learns the stuff, does her stuff on her own. But but her life, her real life, her social life uh, involves a bunch of people I've never met because they're in fan communities and everything is handled online. Um, mm -hmm. I asked her once, like, hey, what do your friends say when they find out that I'm your dad? And she looked at me confused, saying, like, they never find out you're my dad. Why would I ever tell anyone you're my dad? Uh, and, and so, meanwhile, my middle child, Josie, is, is very extroverted. Uh, you know, she does music classes, and, and, and they have an awesome program called Band-Aid, where, uh, it's not just learning music. You actually have to load in your own equipment, tune your own guitars, set everything up, do the gig, and all the parents show up to be the gig or whatever. But but now we're kind of at this place, like she's having such a good time appearing on Scam Nation that it's like, well, may maybe she just wants to start doing real open mic nights and doing real gigs as a magician, you know? And uh um, uh, uh, youngest is just a wild person. I, I have no idea what to make of that, but, um, <laughs> but I, it's, it's hard to know. It's hard to know what's the gift and what's the curse, right? Is it a curse that, that quote unquote real Harvard isn't real Harvard anymore? Or is it a gift that, that, uh, absent real Harvard being real Harvard, anyone could go to Harvard or it's a lot easier to get a Harvard level degree or not. I, I, yeah, I, think, I don't. Yeah, so I, I think the, the the big thing here is that this is all what you make it. Life is what you make it, right? And college is no exception to it. My 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 beef is not that like uh, uh, it is impossible to get what you want out of college. I think it is entirely possible to get what you want out of college. And I got what I wanted out of college, despite the fact that I. I had tremendous resentment while I was going there that I was spending the kind of money I was to to get the product that I was getting. 
that being said, uh, my, my big issue is just number one, the myth that you are not complete until you go to college or that this is the dream that you must fulfill, that it, that it, uh, puts upon you some kind of, uh, a betterment stamp because I know plenty of people that have not gone that have done amazing things. Uh, and then I know a bunch of people who went and maybe got some drinking buddies out of it. Uh, <laughs> And then on, on the other side, it's, it's just, you know, no matter what situation you're in, you have an ability to maximize it. Uh, and, and that's something that, you know, a, a, a Andrew May, one of Andrew Main's first lessons to me as I was going off to college was like, look at all the equipment they have for you. Look at all the, uh, just like raw stuff, like facilities, computers, equipment like they that is there for you if you are not taking advantage of it then you are at fault like uh, uh there is no like guided lesson that's going to make you learn oh wow that's an opportunity seize it and so i think if we're rethinking the future of education or if we are criticizing the current model for it i think that these are the lessons that that need to be emphasized if we want to make sure that everybody's getting their money's worth. Yeah, I think, you know, I think to sort of follow through is, you know, people pointed out, you know, there's been other online courses. Yeah. Distance learning is not a new idea. It's hundreds of years old. What's interesting here is this is the year that Harvard is kind of having it's like traditional TV versus YouTube moment where all of a sudden we're realizing maybe what happens when we can you, you now have to be compared to everybody else offering a product like that. You know, now that you don't have access, a Harvard student doesn't get you know, access to the $800 million, whatever library facilities, you know, on campus, doesn't get to use the $100 million rec center. And you take all that away in those buildings with those amazing prestigious names. And it comes down to the quality of the professors, which arguably there's a lot of universities. When specifically, if you go department to department, there are some departments that are way better in other places, you know, and other places are equivalent. And that's what I'm saying is now is the opportunity for existing or a new thing to say, well, let's create this new era, you know, to create, if a college means sitting in front of a screen and talking to hopefully, you know, a professor, more likely, you know, some TAs and stuff and interacting in a forum, if that's what it means now, who can make the best product? And there's been a lot of, you know, we, people pointed out like, oh, like there's, you know, MIT courseware, stuff like that. I think the quality there isn't as good as it could be. You know, the, the place I go to when I want to learn a topic now is I go to YouTube. The quality of educational material on YouTube, if you know where to look, is fantastic. I learned more about business economics from some 23-year-old kid, you know, in New Brunswick or whatever creating content than I do from, you know, somebody who's a Nobel Prize winner who has a course at MIT just because of just the energy and enthusiasm they put into it. I and think, I think that's I think one of the things, yeah. Part of it is is uh, the nature of fidelity, where I you could watch that 20-minute video on the nature of the wisdom of crowd economics or, or how prices get set or whatever. Uh, and if you get it, you get it, and you're done, and you only spent 20 minutes. And if you didn't get it, you're only one click away from somebody else speaking a slightly different language, yes, still English, but 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 using different metaphors, and then maybe after that twenty minutes you get it, and then uh, yep. and if you still don't get it, there's yet a third twenty minute video. But the point is, uh, even if you go through all three, you're still taking the same one hour that traditionally it would take to eventually get it through your thick head uh, uh, sitting in class while you were, you know, pretending to not check messages. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I think that you could find the different ways, but there is this YouTube's competitive, you know, there is this, if, if I'm not making the best video on how to do this thing, then, you know, I'm going to do my magic video. Well, have you seen scam school? Ugh, shut up, you know, and you've got that, that drive, you know, what was, what was, what was good five years ago? Ain't, ain't as good as the best stuff now right where you know a lot of the college stuff they create is like you know i have you know a friend whose dad's a professor and you know he had to teach his dad how to set up skype to record his videos and I, his dad in person is an amazing teacher watching this guy's videos online eee, right not not a strength but well and I'm that's, and that's the, yeah th th this is like a fairly unchallenged 
industry that is about, I believe, is about to get a rapid, like the horse is about to be out of the barn on a lot of this. And yeah. uh, uh, I, I do think that there will be a rush to set up some kind of like just accreditation might sound you know weird but like when when brian and i had you know a a a night where we were just talking about like what we would do for somebody who didn't want to go to college because we found ourselves repeating a lot of the same stuff to to people that uh hear us criticize college and and say like okay well then what should i do and it's like all right well first off don't go to college unless you know exactly what you want to unless you know how you are going to interact there don't think that this is the expensive way that you're going to have your destiny revealed to you instead do these things. And I think if there's a codification for that, now that seems way more like a prudent way to save money or find out who you are, but still enrich yourself than it was initially when Brian and I were talking about it. And it seemed a little bit more like, you know, fight club or, or you right. know just like getting in a car and driving as far as you can before you run out of gas like uh, uh i think that there is now a world as we've like jumped ahead five years in in four months in terms of us being comfortable with tele everything that now it's like oh wait if i if i just actually made a commitment and maybe there was some tracking you know, an app or something like that, some way that you could keep yourself honest. But if it's like, all right, if I'm watching this stuff and I'm showing comprehension and I'm putting it into practice by doing a thing now, this is not like a, like, Oh, I'm going to, you know, uh, set myself loose into the feral world and hopefully come back with a lesson. It's like, no, this is just smart. Oh, look, you're a self-starter. Yeah, like, I'm, well, and, and uh, uh, you know, it's it's wild seeing, you know, my 16-year-old is already uh, a, a, an established m- member of multiple communities as they do their role-playing, storytelling, whatever. My 12-year-old uh, has already started multiple social accounts as she shares her art stuff. And then also, uh, <laughs> as a side jag, is showing up as stand-in for a, for a major YouTube channel. And it's like, there came this moment over the weekend where I'm like, what is the moral thing for me to do is to say, hey, kiddo, thanks, go back to play. Or is the moral thing to say, you seem to love this, you seem to be good at it. Would you like to continue to learn the aspects of production, storytelling, magic, fundamentals? Uh, would, would the world like to watch your journey over the next six years as you start performing gigs and telling your own stories um i i I don't know like in general uh if your goal is to go to college to figure out what you want to do go to college figure out what you want to do but the second if you're going to college because there's something you want to do the second you have a chance to go straight to doing the thing that you want to do go straight to the thing that you want to do yeah i i will say this my my final thought is We've all been to other countries where people don't have the advantages we have here, you know, and in their parts of our country where, you know, advantages aren't, you know, places where things like a college education or a good college seem very almost impossible to do that. When you can take all the ridiculous costs out of that, you, the administrative overhead, the ridiculous buildings, things like that, and focus on teachers and students and those things, it is exciting because I think about, you know, some person in a lesser developed country the reality they could get a, a a quality degree through distance learning without having to have the family bankrupt, you know, with loans and stuff. We see a lot of, we get a lot of students who come overseas to come to the schools in the United States. They're all middle and upper class, you know, poor yeah. people from other countries don't, don't get access the way, you know, other people do. And that's one of the things is like, I've said, like, you know, people talk, one of the things when you look at like income distributions by like nationality and stuff, the thing I point out is like, you have to remember that part of that has to do with self-selecting because, oh, we only let the rich people in this country come here and they're going to come here and they're going to do really well. We don't do enough to increase the opportunities for people who are even more hard work or determined who are at the bottom. But, you know, you know, that's what excites me is just, oh, man, you know, the idea of, you know, really, really making, 
this kind of education universally available, accessible to just everybody. I mean, think of all the brilliant people out there waiting to happen, you know, with this, the, the, the new discoveries, the new things when these things go, you know, more global. So I'm excited. Got him again. A hundred percent. Take that college. Yeah. yeah. What are you going to yeah. do? Double your fees again? <laughs> Come at me, bro. <laughs> yeah. Oh, God. Uh, so um, I saw an article in my news feed today because I follow stuff dealing with artificial intelligence. And apparently there is a new project that allows you to write to famous people or historical people and have simulated mm. conversations via email. Oh, my gosh. And it sounds amazing. This is such a ripoff. A buddy of mine did a project like this, <laughs> uh, and and so I I don't I don't even know what to say. I don't know. You Maybe know, dangerous we, territory here. It might be. No, we're being silly because this is a project that uh, Andrew created uh, as part of his work with the OpenAI API, uh, uh, and it is extraordinary. Uh, Andrew, do you want to do you want to just lay out uh, uh, what it does? Yeah, so this was the next web did a nice little write up from it. And if you go to AIwriter.app, there's more info on it. I, I've been playing around with OpenAI's API, which is a way to use OpenAI works on artificial intelligence technology. And they're trying to find ways to make it more accessible because when you're working with, let's say, a large neural network that's able to do stuff like text generate, like generate passages of text and try to figure out what you're sending to it, maybe to correct you know, uh, physical addresses and properly sh straighten them or to write summarizations of large text into smaller amounts. And again, there's a lot of applications for it. The problem is that those models that do it are huge. They can take up several gigabytes, 35 gigabytes, I think in the case of like one of the larger ones that's out there, which is not practical for most users. So OpenAI created this API, meaning you just take a little bit of code, a little password and you say, here's some text figure it out, and it sends something back to you. And the API has consumed large amounts of the internet, and it, underst it understands, as we talked about on a pre previous show, it knows who Brian is, who knows who Justin is. It's able to kind of recreate kind of parody versions of, you know, Night Attack. It can also write, you know, compelling for a period of a few paragraphs, at least, fan fiction, et cetera, and has a lot of other potentials. One of the things I decided to experiment with was the ability for it to mimic historical figures. Could I write a letter to Mark Twain and ask him a question and get a Mark Twain response back? Could I do that with Richard Nixon? And I found out that I was getting incredibly realistic responses back most of the time. And so for fun, I built an app where you just write to an email address and I'll, make, I'll be making this more available soon. If you write to an email address, you will get a response back from that person. And so I have some examples there. I don't, Bryce, if you want to take a look at some of those. I'm, I'm reading your uh, letter to Benjamin Franklin in which Andrew opens by saying, Dear Benjamin Franklin, how would you compare 21st century social media to the news and in industry of the 18th century? Warmly, Andrew Maine. Dear Andrew, they are both forms of media that seek to promote uh, content that will interest their audience. In both instances, they'll offer each other a, a people a chance to, to become something bigger than themselves, to be part of a community, a community with shared interests. This is not unlike other forms of media, literature, for example. And like the publishing industry and social media, it's hard to discover the value of some content. A screed against George Washington one day, followed by a raving endorsement of and the next are both from the same source. Is the author rational? Is the content fact-based? A thoughtful post is only a click away from the ravings of someone who has watched too much television. But in both <laughs> cases, it takes time to discover the difference. And in both social media, or in both media and social media, those who are shouting are often the ones who get heard. Warmly, Benjamin Franklin. <laughs> Far I mean, as I know, it's authentic. It's so good. It's no, so they, good. <laughs> there, when Andrew was first work well, working on this, he was just texting me uh, stuff he would get back from Richard Nixon. And obviously with Raise the Dead, I've done a lot, a lot of research into Richard Nixon. And I feel like I have a genuine idea of how he would answer certain questions. And it was eerie. 
Like it, it was so dead on down to the way that Nixon would acknowledge certain things, but always want to come off as a bigger man. And I think that was the, the, the biggest thing that's amazing about this is that it gets at least enough of what we would imagine the personality to be of uh, uh, some of these people by way of making us understand this is how they would write to a stranger. Like this is them taking the time out of their day to write to someone they don't know. And the framework to that, I think is just that, that that's what takes it the extra, the extra mile uh, because it just gives you the human idea of like, Oh, well, how would, I don't know what, how Nixon would respond to me if I were his best friend, if I had talked to him every day, but I do know how they might write to me if I were just a fan asking I mean, him a question. This and, and, and you feel that in this exchange. <clears throat> Dear Hulk, why Hulk smash? Best banner. Dear Bruce, Hulk likes to smash. Why? Hulk not know why. Please help. Your friend, Hulk. <laughs> <laughs> That was my favorite one. <laughs> I'm like, I, I, late at night, I like, I write, I've been testing everybody, and I'll tell you the, the where it went awry. I'm late, I'm like, I'm gonna write to Hulk, your Hulk, why Hulk smash? And then I'm reading this, Hulk, not know why. <laughs> Please help. I'm like, oh my god, poor Hulk. And that's that's the scary part because you get compelling, you will get compelling responses back from people. And, 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 and I need to do, I'll probably elaborate and say how accurate, how good will these be? I'm like, the more the internet knows about this person, the better they will be. Or the more this topic is discussed, the more variety you will get. Um, uh, I, I, I also like the, the fact that the responses oftentimes adopt the, uh, the socially distant tone that you would expect, the professional tone. Uh, for example, this letter, Dear Bruce Wayne, I was wondering if you would sign our petition and make a contribution to our organization, which is dedicated to pro proving the innocence of the Joker. Regards, Andrew Maine, Free the Joker. Andrew. I appreciate the I appreciate the hard work and concerns about your friend the Joker. However, I am afraid I have to decline your <laughs> petition. Sincerely, Bruce Wayne. <laughs> uh yeah. So you can do things like, and I'll probably go a little bit more into it. Like, like some people do are if that person's like there is a famous director who's well respected who's known for being kind of brusque and stuff. And if you ask him, hey, can I get some advice? He'll basically tell you to f off. But if you're like, hey, thank you so much for agreeing to work with me on my project and letting me know that I could write you and ask you questions, how would I do this? So if you manipulate the AI by basically saying, we're friends, oh, I'm your cousin so-and-so, whatever, you will get a response like that. They will respond to you that. And you can you can write to people. Like if I want Isaac Asimov to like finish something for me, he won't. But if I write to him as Arthur C. Clarke, a little more you know, willing to do that because it knows who Arthur C. Clarke is too. And if there's stuff, it's just, it's amazing. It's amazing to see how adaptive the API really is at all that. That's amazing. Yeah. So I just, I got Tom Merritt just texting me. Apparently he says this was going to be a, a topic on DTNS before he realized that, that I was the one who made it. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, he won't. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's like, ah, screw this. No. So anyhow, uh, AI writer dot app, check it out. I'm going to be, uh, we'll see right now. It's an experiment we're rolling out. We got to make sure this is used safely and appropriately. Um, you know, I've tried to put filters in place. I don't want everybody like trying to write to Hitler. You know, I don't want to you know. Tell me more of your ideas. No, don't. Please, please don't. Please, we, no, we, we, no, no, yeah. no. Uh, I tried to build in an obscenity filter, and then I'm like, well, let me test it with, you know, metaphors and analogies and stuff. And then so I took a bunch of stuff from like Harry Potter fan fiction, like slash fiction and stuff. And it basically just broke my filter because apparently like, uh, uh, you know, a magic wand in any other context would seem pretty normal, you know? Like, who would suspect? <laughs> I mean, all of a sudden it turns into AI Cummings, am I right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Come check out my cauldron. Mm, I think this is... So, all right. yeah. Oh, come uh, on. AI Cummings, uh, that was pretty good. I know. It was great. I was leaving it breathe. It was, <laughs> that, was, that was it. That was, that, was the, that, was the, that was the line. Yeah. So... Uh, anyhow, thanks for letting me talk about that. I'm very, very excited and more to talk about. I've been kind of doing these 
periodic projects, working on different stuff. This was a project from last weekend. It was had a conversation with somebody on Saturday, and I'm like, oh, it'd be neat to make this more accessible to other people because I want other people to my, – my goal is to make these tools available to as wide a number of people as possible. I don't want AI just to be a thing of a few corporations or some people who have some you know, uh, background in machine learning. I want everybody to have access to it and do that, and then it's fun to see this. So there we go. Um, gentlemen, do any picks? Yeah, I, uh, I watched, uh, Terminator and Terminator two, uh, which, uh, I didn't think I would watch the first one. Cause all I wanted to see was, was the second one. Justin made a really good point of like, Hey, your kids will never grow up in the universe where, uh, either one lived in a vacuum, uh, and, and uh, the chance for them to see, you know, Ar Arnold Schwarze Schwarzenegger, who uh, is the only, I believe, uh, AFI top 100, both villain and hero for the same character. Uh, like, let's go for it. So we went through the original Terminator. It was, it, it, it hung in there, I guess. Uh, but uh, Terminator 2, man, it was so much fun to watch my 12-year-old because uh, my 16-year-old, like, she knew, she knew the conceits of both movies. Uh, uh, but the 12 year old to have her be genuinely confused for the first 20 minutes of that movie as to who is the good guy and who is the bad guy. Uh, and then have that resolved when you're like, Oh my God, he's the good guy this time. So much fun. Highly recommend it. If you have the means deceive your children. I'm, I love the first one. Cause like that movie, it was independently financed. And you look at the budget it was made for, and it was, you know, Cameron fought and fought to be able to make that movie. Because at that point, you know, he was a guy that did some VFX for Corman movies, and he was known as kind of an up-and-coming screenwriter. And, you know, this, there's the story of how he was asked to write, like, Rambo 2 and Aliens at the same time. And, uh, you know, he, Terminator was in the process of being made, but he wanted to direct Aliens. And they're like, no, we're, we're looking for a different quality director, whatever. And then... Terminator came out was a huge hit like oh you know we you know it'd be great for directing aliens your script that you wrote for us would be you and but you look at Terminator for the budget was made for what he pulled off I mean way punching above its weight really oh, really yeah. really yeah it's it's you know it's my girlfriend you know she was born after that movie it's one of her favorite movies of all time uh yeah total mind blow watching uh, because it had been a good like 20 years since i'd seen it but uh the uh the forensic psychologist the the cop uh, head doctor uh, discovering yeah. realizing that that's the same one who has now made a career on sarah connor in t2 was awesome oh yeah oh it is the the follow-up the it did a wonderful t1 to t2 is great it's like batman begins to dark knight we set up this great universe in the first one and the second one, let's pick up the pieces. Let's really think of where things lay and it can't lie. And it's like Empire Strikes Back. It's just this really, we can, well, we can go bigger. We don't have to repeat. It's, there is this sort of repetition of sort of a similar thing, but let's change it up. And, but I like the first one, like that's the police station. I, first time I, I remember seeing it the first time they're in the, you're in a police station. You're safe. Everything's fine. Oh, hey, Everything's yeah, cool. except not you know? so much, Al. Uh, so, so the question, Justin is, uh, do I do the same trick with alien and aliens or am I allowed to go straight to aliens? Both. No, yeah. I mean, I, well, cause both fit the reason this came up was because you, you and your, you were showing your 16 year old daughter something that she was like very frustrated with the very uh a, a feminine uh a heroine right, right. Or, or or a very prissy female very girly female character and so terminator came up and aliens because it's like well if the two most like iconic badass women characters are sarah connor and ripley and you kind of got to see where they come from to appreciate that journey. That's why you had to watch Terminator before you see her in, in Terminator 2. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think similarly, you don't, you, you won't quite appreciate, not that Ripley's a shrinking violet in, in Alien, but like to see her as badass she, war commando I, I think you you need to appreciate that first movie. she's also i don't think they even hint that she's secretly the the protagonist until almost halfway through that movie like they they yeah, give absolutely. you a long time to think she's just another one of the crew it, yeah. that's and it's one of the brilliant things about it is that uh you 
you don't know, and as she, but you see her strengths in Ford, and you know part of the reason why that character was originally written for a man. No kidding. Yeah. And that, and then it was there was, hey, why don't we change this to a woman? And I think that was was wonderful thinking was because that, you know, the kind of overcame the writer's bias of like, oh, I know how to write normal people, and then I know how to write women, which is a very bad way to think about things. Right. And to say like, let's put a person to a difficult situation, blah 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 blah, and then oh yeah, woman. You know, and I think that's part of what made it so wonderful and why it was, I think it was one of the most, I think that was, that really was a breakthrough role, breakthrough character in movies, you know, and, and I think that a lot of, a lot of female characters, the really good ones have stemmed from, you know, Ellen Ripley and Sarah Connor. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so cool. Any other picks? Yeah, so uh, I've talked a little bit about, you must remember this, the podcast, history podcast about Hollywood history. And I had heard when I, whenever I brought it up that uh, there was probably the most famous season that had been made of this was a 12-part series on Charlie Manson's Hollywood. And I am now, I think, nine episodes into it and I wonder where I either it might just be parallel sensibilities, but uh, I wonder if this was something that came across Tarantino's world as he was writing um, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, because it, whether or not they had anything to do with each other's creation, it is a, an excellent uh, companion piece to understanding a lot of, of what Tarantino was saying about that moment in time, uh, uh, specifically where Hollywood was in the late sixties, where show business was in the late sixties. The fact that there was this, uh, uh, specifically this creaking element of the free love hippie movement that was souring. And and that's where where Tarantino's Once Upon a Time in Hollywood got criticized was like, oh, well, the, why is this movie so anti hippie? And it's like, you know, all the protagonists are these like, you know, straights and, and they're, you know, criticizing this movement. And yeah, I mean, the Manson family was the worst elements of it. But uh, there is a, 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 a larger context to it that I was able to even. I haven't rewatched uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood yet, having finished this, but I'm excited to because I, I think that there's there's a lot uh, to be said about like what that hippie movement was, where it interacted with the crumbling uh, form of Hollywood at the time, and more specifically, uh, you know what? A, a, and this is where I think there was a lot of a similarity between these two works. Just what a fascinating character uh Sharon Tate was and and how she um uh was was you know had her had her life uh cut short obviously tragically but um understanding even the fuller context of of Sharon Tate in this uh podcast series makes you just even all the more appreciative that uh, once upon a time in Hollywood makes the creative decisions that it makes by the end of that movie, uh, because you you recognize even even more so it's even an even richer appreciation that, uh, you know, life is unfair and it would be nice if things didn't happen that way. Yeah, I, I really want to check that because it is that you, you know we take a thing and we judge it for where it started, which was you know the idea of kind of a lot of you know the hippie movement had a lot of these great values about trying to be, move things forward. And then the sociopaths showed up and, you know, the, another thing that gets forgot is for Jim Jones, the people's temple came out of that. You know, he was yeah. actually, you know, a Marxist who said, Hey, how do I get people on board with this stuff? And he had the support of a lot of people in California, he moved to San Francisco. It's like, you know, you had, you know, like Jane Fond and other people like, Oh, you're doing great work and stuff because he was seen of that movement. And then, you know, a trip to another country, nine hundred people dead later. We're like, no, that's something different. I'm like, I'm like, well, you know, you never well, know show up at your party. And and that's the thing is what I did not appreciate because I, I have not read a lot about the Manson murders aside from kind of surface level stuff. 
is just realizing, especially in San Francisco and in LA, uh, there were just these areas that was almost like a job fair for gurus, like lost people would just mm -hmm. show up and you just listen to these, the, the idea of just like, yeah, I don't know. Am, am I God? You want to listen to me talk? Like you want to experience these drug fueled uh, journeys? Like, well then come on. And some are more about the drugs and some are more about the sex and some are more about the religion, but you would just kind of, mall sample court all these gurus and then you would find one that you would follow but the idea that people would leave each other for other gurus like uh, uh it was very very common and then charlie manson as he kind of comes up uh, uh as a career criminal and somebody that idolized pimps and and was fascinated by how to win friends and influence people and some of the Scientology teachings, like the, the, the game became for him and many of these other gurus retention, people retention, yeah. you know, like, yeah. and, and, and this is where things start to get into these very, very dark places. But, uh, it, you know, it, it's obviously compared to some of Karina Longworth's later stuff. It's a little bit less polished. Um, but the, the research is obviously there. And I think her, her greatest, um, her power pitch is really breaking down some of the, the, the labyrinthian business elements of Hollywood and specifically who's married to who, who was friends with who, how do things get done? And there's a lot of great stuff there specifically around uh, uh, Charlie Manson's push to become a superstar musician. In an alternate universe. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, apparently it's like he had met like the, 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 the reason why he didn't become a musician was because he couldn't handle himself recording. He had, he had multiple opportunities to be, to record demos with like uh, people that would have names who's carried that, that would have sheltered him through, but multiple times he gets in a recording studio, multiple times it ends up with him pulling a knife on the recording op because they're trying to tell him how to speak into a microphone correctly. Oh, yeah. Let me get a knife. <laughs> Sorry, Bryce, you were saying what? <laughs> I, I do have a pick, but yeah, if, yes. <laughs> I, mean, uh, I, uh, I, I just finished. So I do the, the Friday night, uh, video game streams here on Twitch, and we just finished up uh, a new, uh, a relatively new game. I guess it's been it been out for uh, uh, maybe a couple years now. Uh, called Life is Strange Two. This is a um, a different story, but it's kind of in the same sort of uh, vein as the original. Um, and and I am really, I it's it's really a shame that uh, that this game did not get as much. Um, I don't know conversation about it uh, versus the first game. You know, the Life is Strange one is um, you you play like a high school girl who gets time travel powers when her when her friend gets shot in front of her. Um, and it's, deal. <laughs> well, but but it, but it's like well, okay, well now the apocalypse is happening. Guess what? You're using these powers and nature is is revolting. And at the end of that, spoiler alert for this five year old game. You either get to save the town and your friend dies or the town is destroyed and you two live. Um, and it's set in this like five, it's an episodic game. So like as you go through the pieces, you make choices and people will remember this and all. Um, but at the end of the day, you just make that choice at the end of the game. And what was really, really eye-opening, especially in this last episode of Life is Strange 2, is that uh, you are making choices along the way because it's uh, your little brother who has a superpower. And so you are not only um, making your own decisions on how to travel across the country with him, but also like how to raise him because he's like 10 years old. Um, and so that factors into the end of the game. So it's not just what do you decide, but also what about the results of the, you know, your brother who you tried to raise, what type of person is he? And that affects the ending. You kind of have a matrix, a small matrix of endings. Um, and it's, it, it's, it's really like, um, really, uh, a, a story of the times, right? Like it, the initial conflict is that your father gets shot, uh, by, by the police, uh, and he's in completely innocent. Um, and 
you know, that you are two kind of Latino brothers who are making their way down to Mexico. And there's all there's there's all sorts of really good stuff in there. Um, and it's it's just such a shame because the first game got a lot of attention for being like, oh, isn't this bad adults writing teen dialogue stuff? Um but I think this is really sweet and, and, and a really gripping story. Um, so uh, if you've got, it's also like uh, relatively, each episode is only like three, three and a half hours long. Um, so if you've got, got a little bit of time, uh, it's a really great story in Life is Strange too. Nice. Yeah. Andrew? My, my pick is, is uh, like, I don't, uh, I, 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 I I don't want to. I wasn't very satisfied. I'll put it this way. Okay. Uh, Westworld season three. What I would say, the music's great. And some of the production values were really, really cool. Really, really cool. Actors were good. So the actors are great, great cast. Great, great scenes, cast, great, great set cast. design. Scenes. And, and I, I've never made a TV show like this. I've never done that. I've never worked on a network to do narrative content. I do not know. And I, and I know, I know I've gone to the, the first part of that and I've seen where, Oh, we want it to be this, or we want it to be that. And we want it to be this. And my, I think that what I loved about Westworld, you know, season one, which I was very mixed about though, was there were neat themes. There was often, there were some really intelligent observations on stuff. And then sometimes it just felt like a show that wasn't an HBO show. And season three, I felt like it wasn't sure where it wanted to, like you're following a plot lines for two characters that really have nothing to do with the events of that, that literally like they're trying to set for season four. And, and maybe I don't get it and I'll probably go back. And I, my appreciation for season one went up when I watched it again and sort of made allowances for that. But I would say I love the music, and I don't mean that lightly. I think that like there is some some of the quality of some of the stuff that's going in right now. Like I'm watching Watchmen right now, and the scoring is wonderful. I mean, wonderful. And I think that's one of the things I guess I'm going to talk Agreed. about. Agreed. Wholeheartedly West, agreed. Watchmen's Westworld season three. music, awesome. Mm-hmm. Westworld season three soundtrack. That is my pick. Uh, Westworld season three is so bizarre because, and we we talked a lot about this because uh, we slow motion ran through it week Mm. week after week. And it's like somehow season three manages to be less than the sum of all of its parts, because every single thing you could point to, I could say that was amazing. All of the acting, amazing. Most of the writing, amazing. All of the set pieces, amazing. Special effects, amazing. Uh, 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 The the, the scale of the world, amazing. All Mm -hmm. of those things, amazing. Uh, The, the the bravery to step outside of the narrative that was in season one and season two also brave and amazing and yet somehow after all of that every single week it was like all right let's let's just do it again my (laughs) you know my my thing was like i loved like things i loved i love they went around the world to like they showed they went to places like dubai and like Singapore and stuff to show like the future because there are these we have futuristic cities today. And I really, I really liked that. Okay. My, my, my confusion, I'll just put it that was like, you know, Aaron Paul, I think is a great actor, but this is a character when we're introduced to him, you know, what his big reveal is, you know, you know, the world you're in, in the first episode, you know, the thing. And you're like, man, we got seven episodes in and you're telling us this is the truth of it. Like we've seen enough black mirror. We've seen enough stuff. We know the language of this to know, where this is and it's also like we didn't get enough of like it's this dystopian world where one it looks pretty awesome other than you know people are playing a real live version of grand theft auto it's like the cities are they're showing la i'm like man they they, the homeless people they've they've got jobs and stuff now or whatever like man this looks clean i want to live in this la as opposed to the la i'm in right now and so yeah, that was like, you know, it's the Phantom Menace problem. Like, oh, save my people. We never met them. We don't know who they are. <laughs> yeah, even you know? during, you know, that moment of uprest, uh, the episodes of uprest, I guess, in the back half of that, like, other than very specific riot scenes, there's not like pedestrians or... No. Anyone walking their dog <laughs> somebody, or nothing. Somebody picked up like three <laughs> copies of the LA Times and just sort of threw them up in the yeah. air and said, mm-hmm. chaos. <laughs> and <laughs> walked off <laughs> like that PA got fired later that day. <laughs> yeah, I I felt like that 
there are it had and again the themes it wanted to deal with i love because you know it's this you know spoiler alert it's the idea of you know using some big powerful algorithm to determine the fate of everybody which you know i call it china as told in the you know la in westworld and i think that's it's a very good topic, and I, and I love to see that sci-fi has sort of moved on and caught on to ideas about simulate, you know, seeing, you know, the simulation, you know, AI and stuff. I like that. I like that we're getting more intelligent sort of observations on this stuff now. So, I am. I would say if you if you made it through season two, watch it. Maybe season four, you know, it'll be it'll go somewhere kind of cool because they certainly felt like they were setting stuff up in season three because you're there are two storylines in there that do nothing. To resolve the conflict of season three, it it does than, it does you, look like at the very end of season three they set up sort of a there's going to be a big leap to whatever's next. Uh, so yeah, uh, yeah, over over time. So yeah, like the cast is great. It's a great cast, and I think uh, I, I I like I like it's always like I like everybody involved. I like you, everybody involved, and it's Andrew, and it's hard. I don't want to be like ah, oh, what's that? I, have you watched devs yet? He loved devs. We've talked about oh, okay. Devs. All right, we did. Okay, I can't. Brian, I can't remember. I, I, I remember. was texting you about devs. Yes, I was like, you gotta watch. It's hard to no, remember because we. I'm the one who haven't who hasn't watched. Right, it. Justin, Justin hasn't, hasn't watched, watched it. it. He's the one who wants to He's convinced about that it. Bryce yeah. hates it. I, I uh, love because it. he does. And he hates because, it. Yeah. I, and it's because of your recommendation. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. Devs, devs is my favorite. Let's talk about what. This, the That's not what I heard Bryce say, though. <laughs> all right, all right. I heard yeah, Bryce yeah. say the put opposite. A, put a pin that. in that. <laughs> I, I'm, yeah, did he went? Did he made that podcast a daily? Was really weird. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's just weird, man. Save Bryce it hates for dense, the many so. worlds where we have more time, which is <laughs> not this one. Bryce hates <laughs> yeah. devs. Yeah. Second, my second favorite thing of new content about the feature is upload. I think that you know, mm-hmm. doing it and sort of let's look at this from a slightly skewed kind of absurd way. I really like upload. Right yeah, on. upload is is yeah. light. It's it's goofy. Yeah. Um, but better, better yeah. than sp- Space Force. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, because because upload the, you upload watched... knows what it's trying to do. Okay. Yeah, upload the characters are real, and upload it's ca- real characters in a crazy sort of future. Right? They yeah. they act like normal people for the most part. Where Space Force, I'm going to be wacky this scene. No, I'm going to be serious. No, I'm wacky, and you're like, I. I don't know. Like you're supposed to be an idiot. Now you're teaching your daughter trigonometry. I don't know where I'm going with this. Very, so. very mixed message out of Space Force. I just finished that this weekend. Ugh. Yeah. So. <laughs> so yeah. Anyway. Gentlemen, it's been weird. Hey. Quick break for me. Ooh, All right. I gotta pee. Hello, everybody. We'll get uh, some after things. Actually, I think we did get an email. Let me double check it. How you doing, Justin? Dude, you know, um, just kind of making my way in the world. In the world uh, today. In the world today. I got my um, taxes going to get done Ooh. on Wednesday. But I actually like, <laughs> I've been getting my taxes done by this same place for a while. And I, I have financial anxiety. Um, so I, I, I tend to get nervous with taxes and I put them off and, uh, Mm -hmm. part of it is like, I don't want to go back and sort things because it's, you know, uh, things that I don't have natural talents in, like paying attention to something for a long time or details, you know? Uh, so I actually carved out Saturday and Sunday, spent the the majority of both days um just going through like i had a year ago or a year and a half ago had a business card mm-hmm. that like the vast majority of all my business expenses go on and so i just like went through all of them and actually used normally i just kind of randomly sort of put them in categories that the tax people then frustratingly have to re-put in other categories. Yeah. Um, but this time I took their, their worksheet and listed everything out myself and I did it by did, hand. Did you, and... did, did you file yourself or did you, do you have a person? I have a person. Okay. Okay. And so 
Wednesday will be when I sit down with my person and Gosh. my person will uh, take a look at things and uh, uh, we will we will go from there. But it's the first time that I feel like prepared for one of these meetings, whereas before mm. I'm, I'm just like, ah, let me just throw them a bunch of shit like yeah. you know and be like you fix make better please um but i i feel a lot more comfortable on it and um man i traveled the the, the difference yeah. in travel last year and this year is going to be stark stark because <laughs> when i was looking at like all my expenses uh from just like meals and stuff like it was Insane, God, bet. yeah, damn. Like there were, there were times where I was like, I think I came back from Austin or Florida. And then I what flew out the same day to go to meet Will in Vegas. Oh, right. Like, and That's then came a... back the next day after, like, uh -huh. it was just, man, oh, I gotta get my stand in. Yeah. yeah. I remember that scheme. I, that, that scheme sounds familiar to me. Um, that and uh oh what was it um uh you, were you got you you were here in Austin and you guys went to go do Heaton's show yeah and no then... we went from Austin to Dallas and then back mm -hmm. and we were gonna drive but then at like <laughs> you know two o'clock in the morning we decide to fly but the only way we could make it work is if we are out on like the 550 from austin to dallas yeah you, uh, you had to like wait a while to take that what 30 minute <laughs> so no well no no, no. Was, well i then go to sleep at the headquarters but the headquarters were were much more of an abandoned uh, um, an, an, an abandoned shed than they were a functioning multimedia uh, a thing mm -hmm. and so I had a very uncomfortable uh, very cold night's sleep at, at, at the headquarters for three hours and then went to do that and then we flew we flipped it right back and we're back by like five but no I, I, I will the, the travel budget's going down in in 2020 compared mm -hmm. to 2019 because not only obviously is nobody traveling quite at the same clip but also like holy crap i put some miles on in in 19 yeah uh, uh andrew i i forwarded you an email that we received um i'm not sure i want to get your your take on it unless we've got a topic that we want to hit today seen a nod okay cool yeah i don't know about his specific example but i bet we can um talk about how we do that cool uh yes sorry oh no worries Um, Let me ask you guys a question here, and 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 let I'll turn off the AC before we start. I I, I heard a cons a term, and I don't maybe now's not the time to talk about it, but it, the idea is being a somebody who is data driven versus media driven, meaning you know you determine your priorities by what data tells you versus what the media determines them for you. Hmm. And you look at like you know. Would, a lot of the issues. Would would this be a rough analog in the Myers Briggs uh, P versus J, perceiving versus judging? Uh, whereas a J type does the math, has the list, they know exactly what they're going to do because they pre planned or whatever. Whereas a P type is just like, well, I don't know, I'm not there yet. Oh, I'm here now. Yeah, we'll we'll do this. I think more like when. I, I, if I were to categorize my friends and how they react to things and what makes them upset or what doesn't, I have some friends that are whatever comes across social media, whatever media, their, their values and ethics are sort of determined by whatever's put in front of them. And they yeah. may not be aware, but they may consider and, and themselves skeptics. And that's my weakness. That's on me. But go ahead. 
Yeah, but but and then I have other friends who are more like, okay, this is what people are talking about. Let me see what the data shows, you know, and let me see, let me evaluate how I'm going to feel based upon the data as opposed to, you know, that. And I think that's sort of a, and we see a lot of. I, I'm, I'm not entirely sure where this is headed, but I, I could spare 20 minutes to hear more of your pamphlet. I'm, 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 I'm in like, do you, uh, I have, yeah, I, I have, I have thoughts on this. Okay. All right. We'll, we'll take the question we got from the person first, then we could talk about this, then we'll just end it when it devolves into... Right. Let me just grab a soda and then we'll jump in. Taxes, taxes, taxes. I know. I actually screwed up because I thought I was like, oh, finally, I'll have to get my taxes done. And then I accidentally made my tax appointment for after the twice delayed tax day <laughs> deadline. <laughs> yeah, I was like, it was like next I, year. And I'm like, I'm like, oh, crap. Let me at least move it up. So I am doing it before the insanely late uh, tax deadline. Ooh. Yeah, I'm in that debate. Like, do I do the approximation, write the check, ask for the postponement till October, figure it out then, or... You know, yeah. I almost always do that. I always do that. I just, I just like, ah, I'm gonna write a large number, you know, and then file, and then like, I need some money back, or I gotta pay you more. Whoopsie doos. Yeah. You know. All right, you guys ready to do this? Ready. Let's do it. Yep. Get that AC for me. Yeah. There you go. All right, I'm gonna count you in, Andrew. In three, two. Hello and welcome to the After Things podcast. I'm joined by Brian Brushwood. Hello. Justin Robert Young. Ah, hello. And Mr. Bryce Castillo. Thank you, Andrew Maine, who didn't say his name today. Thank you. Eh. (laughs) (laughs) One of these days it was bound to happen. (laughs) Gentlemen, uh, we got an email... And uh, this is cool. This is a question to us about uh, basically kind of like knowledge systems, note taking, et cetera. And the question is, is I wonder if any of you guys take notes as a personal knowledge management system regularly and what system they use. There's the popular Zettelkasten system uh, with popular software tools being the archive, Zettler and Rome Research, even Evernote can be used. Thanks. And so uh, the Zettelkasten system... I don't know much about it. I had a friend, uh, I think just, I think you remember him, Jeff Ruttenberg, who was mm-hmm. just into every, you know, from the, you know, Franklin Covey planner, every sort of system. He was a guy that was just fascinated into all these sort of different ways of doing that. And this one, I remember hearing briefly about, but basically kind of a, kind of a note taking system and a way to reference other notes and stuff. And it's just, there are a lot of different schemes for sort of like, how you can kind of organize knowledge and, you know, how do you reference one thing to another? And some of these things are, you know, and this is an old, old system. This is like hundreds of years old, right? And this kind of came back to when people were, writing used to be a very linear sort of thing. Like I'm going to have an expression of a thought and it's going to be very linear. But then you started to have more complex thoughts and things that say, well, here, I want to reference this idea here. I want to do a tangent here not because it's a work for somebody else, but for you to organize your own thoughts. And that was what one of these, this system was sort of like, is, you know, you see, you had writing, and then within a few hundred years, you watch the evolution of tools and systems to organize stuff, Dewey Decimal System for books and things like that. So do you guys do notes? Do you do brainstorming? How do you organize them? Uh, I've gone through multiple phases. Um, Maybe the best phase of note-taking I did was when I was preparing for the pitches for uh, what became scam school and scam nation, like there are, there are just bricks of uh, three by five cards where it's like, I've, I've, I, you know, reading through book after book, it's like, Oh, the idea is do this with a napkin, uh, make this prediction, whatever, uh, a quick reference to what page I found it on. Um, I haven't, weirdly uh as i moved into the world of comedy with justin there's been uh like uh at most there'll be a piece of scratch paper now 
that just says Josie's butt uh Callie farted uh act three uh fame and then that, that's about as much as I can write down. Uh, b- but it's only because Justin and I on the comedy show have built up a shorthand where we sort of know that we just need a very, very loose framework to go anywhere. And nowadays, um, whatever note taking I would have done, oftentimes as we go back, because it's been 12 years of doing this stuff, it's much, much easier for me to just go back and scroll through, well, what did I do 12 years ago? And then, and then see something and say like, oh yeah, but that was dumb and wrong for this reason. Let's fix it this time. And, and so, and so it's, it's almost as though I'm living a slow motion groundhog day. And as a result, don't feel the need to do as much note taking as I should. Uh, but maybe that's something I should revisit. Uh, I'm a terrible note taker. I'm a terrible organizer. Uh, so I don't, I probably should, um, and increasingly with larger research projects like raise the dead, I find myself having to go back and, and just by memory, remember where I found stuff where I probably should be, uh, a little bit more diligent in, in, you know, pinning the ideas that I want to follow back up on uh you know just internally so i know them a little bit better uh but no i've i've never really done it i've tried a few times there was that hot moment in the um you know the late aughts early tens when uh like the 43 folders stuff and the thing averse like there was a lot of personal note taking that had GTD. like a moment yeah yeah or yeah mm-hmm. getting things done like uh and I just never had the, uh, I never really had the, 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 the system seemed really cool, but I could never grok it on a level that I needed to come back to it. And so it just kind of fell flat for me. Yeah. Um, the, the, oh. I don't do a lot of note taking, but the most I'll do, and I haven't even done this in a few years is I would have like a moleskin, uh, sketchbook, online sketchbook, and I would just write everything there. Um, and like, it do um like indents like tabs like uh are a hierarchy sort of thing you know go down and down and down and then in a list and then go out one and then um but i i, I haven't really needed stuff andrew you must have some some sort of system right yeah i'm writing. gonna send you a picture which i'll show you one of the things that i do i i have different things for different sort of projects and one of the habits i've gotten into is when i sit down to do a thing I often will start off with writing like a Google Doc. And what I do in there is I'll sort of say, this is the thing I'm doing. This is what it's about. I really believe in mission statements because I think it's very easy to get lost in a project and forget the intent. And for me, it is. And so if I sit down and I'll write a Google Doc and say, hey, this is like if I'm doing a software project, I kind of start off with like, this is what I'm working on. Like we talked about in the other show, my project AIWriter.app, which had the idea a week ago Saturday, and I sat down on Saturday you know, evening, and I said, oh, I'm going to do this. I need to have this, this, this. So I did a Google Doc on it. I often never go back to it, but just putting my thoughts into another medium helps it be very clear to me. And then I will, it depends upon how I have to break a thing down. Like I have, like I have a notebook next to me for, this is, you know, I have to go look through here to see like when I break, it's like if I need to do a software thing, I'll say like, I've been building like a voice interface for the OpenAI API, way to talk to it, have it talk to you. And I had, I just built a little simple flow chart, you know, just so I know, you know, okay, this is where the data is going. If I write a book, you know, I have a system for a book and I, that's a photo I just, Bryce just showed. If you want to show that again, this is my latest book. And Basically, what I did is I, I needed to write from different points of view, from two, two different characters. This is my new Jessica and Theo book. And so I knew when the character switched back and forth. And so I had it organized, you know, both it's organized laterally and horizontally. This probably looks like somebody who's a highly organized person or psychotic. I used to not be this organized. I used to be not organized at all. I used to be just seat of the pants, do whatever I do and plan. But I found the more I was, the more I planned things and was organized, the more successful the outcome. Right. 
Sorry. Yeah. I muted I mean, myself uh, to sneeze so everybody knows why there's a pause. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I I I have found myself uh with a current project uh doing more you know, I think par part of it is in anything, and this is probably where my disconnect came in, is that I need to understand the form of something before I can understand filling it in and organizing it. Like, I need to kind of see the 360 and, like, the the workflow that I've had with larger projects now is, you know, to just get, um, like, with, like, Raise the Dead, what I found is that the best way to go for me is to write an absolute garbage draft, like just get to the end of it and know that it is bad, but then record it uh, and then listen to that recording just so I can visual, I, I can now grok it as an unformed ball of clay. And then I'll, I'll think about it like, Oh no, no, no. Here's the story. The story is like where I found myself being connected and then I went away from it because it was a garbage draft. That's what I need to focus on. Here's where I need to build up if I want to get to this place at the end. And so at that point I could now understand, and I'd done that enough times uh, that I now got like, oh, okay, well, here's what a raise the dead episode is. It's got this thing at the front. It's got this element. It's got this one big story. And then we have our kind of wrap up and where, where, where are they now is at the end. And it's like, only when I realized that, which was like after the first season, did I realize, oh, I can break this up into nine segments and I can write for those nine segments. And so now my garbage drafts will be just a little less garbage because I will at least know this is is the form of it. But I literally just had to do a bunch of random trash <laughs> before I even figured out that like these were holes that I needed to fill like that, that I could even chop things up in, in that way. And so now I'm a lot more organized, but before, Oh man, like I, I, I think where I spun my wheels a lot more is that I would just work so much on the drafts. I would write a draft and then review it as a, as a written word and I would perfect it as a written thing. And then I'd read it and be like, Oh, this sucks. Like yeah. this might and, read and, well, and, but uh, it's not going to speak well. Uh, I, I, I've, I've, I've only written a few books, but uh, uh, the best advice I ever got, and I've, we've talked about this before, is turn off the monitor. Like disconnect your ability to edit as you write. You have to write first, and then you edit. Um, uh, recently, I was trying to think of how on this, you know, how to build an independent brand, whatever. Uh, book uh, I, I I wrote uh, the tone was entirely too hostile there's too many curse words but I sent a it, it's a way too cocky uh, but I sent a copy over to uh, Andrew and I was like uh, look uh, all these things need to be fixed but uh, I literally would never have written this if you hadn't had called me out for for the voice and the idea of uh, an I don't know an almost self-loathing how to guide uh i don't think i've i've seen uh, in in in, in I, I, success world I and mean, i owe you a call because i want to talk to you about that at some point i want to i want to wrap my head around it well, well and, maybe, and, maybe, I, and maybe the answer where we're going to get eventually on the call is is that i write it in the self-loathing voice and then just somebody who is not me removes all the self-loathing <laughs> parts i have I have some thoughts okay. about right. this and we'll talk. We'll talk. I, I I'll say that what both of those processes, like yeah, we, sometimes like you can have, like we can, people can say this is the perfect system until we know what our work is. It's really hard. And somebody can come in, I can come in and say, Oh, you need to do it this way. And like, I need to understand things from the inside out. So I need to know what I want to do. And I would say, Justin, you, you talked a lot about what I see a lot of writers go through is they, set out to make the work and then they go back and try to fix the work, which, and I would say the next step is to say, what is the minimal version of it you can create where you will spot the flaws? And that's what I do with my outlines yeah. is, and I write, so I write these outlines that are like pretty, I can spot the plot flaws in an outline. I go look through this and I go, oh, I need to fix this. And I, I noticed that this is a thing that I noticed with myself and other people. Sometimes I would start to write an outline that I'd stop halfway through like, no, no, I just want to write this. But I'd often stop when I didn't know where the outline was going to go, and I assumed that writing the story would tell me. 
And I think that's kind of a mistake, at least in my case, because I think that what that means is I don't know where it's going to go. And the answer will not magically manifest in the middle of the story. It means I need to go a couple steps back in my outline and think it through. And, you know, I, I probably talk a little bit too much about, you know, my writing speed more than I probably should in some places, because I think that leads to people making assumptions. And, you know, the thing that I, I don't emphasize enough is how much my process affects that before then, how much of the system I use to write outlines to do that means that my first drafts don't get, they don't get edited down, they get added to, you know, and I think that's, that's, I, I, I think that's a thing, a, a thing where everybody should think about, not everybody, some people might want to think about is how do I, what's the minimal version that I can go in and fix? So when I go do the bigger version, I'm not having to go change 40% of it. Yeah. So. Yeah. And that's, it, it, uh, I, I would say in, in my process, most of what I, what, where I need to improve is what Andrew said, just get to the minimum viable, like, all right, what's the thing I need to just like listen to, to get it to the audio level where it's like, okay, this is closer to what it could be. The better I'm going to get at this, the more organized they get at this, the more I understand the form, the better my garbage drafts are going to be. And the, and the more I can spend on making a more informed first attempt into a better, uh, uh, final product, uh, you know, but it, it's um, it's a process. Yeah. So uh, another thing I do is I I've been talking this for I use Apple Notes, I use the Notepad app a lot, I use hashtags. It's a great way just to keep track of stuff. It just you know a lot of those earlier systems like Zettelkast and stuff like this were invented prior towards using electronic systems to help you or sort and organize things. And you know the they mentioned Evernote, which Evernote was always a bit unwieldy for me. I played with a lot in the beginning, but it just became too much of you know i tried to do everything which i think for some people it's wonderful google docs i think could be improved a lot but i still just do a lot of it like just make a google doc throw it in there you know it's you know it's in that other hemisphere and then i can find it later on you know smaller stuff just notes and i think that makes it easy so yeah i know it's bad form and unpopular but i still write myself emails like uh before that's great uh, why is that well, well I, I, because people say you shouldn't use your email as a to-do list and and if you're me somebody who habitually treats a email flow like a river where you can either grab it or not or whatever at the very least i could say you know which one of these did i send to myself and then kind of glance over and say oh you know what that seemed like a good idea at the time but i don't think so or whatever. Yeah, I, I think that sounds great. I think that often, you know, we make decisions about, you know, e email in 2010 or even email in 2000 is different than email in 2020 with labels and sorting and all this sort of stuff. Um, I, I think that, I think in like, I use Google Docs because I'm pretty sure of the permanence of that. You know, I use notes because I'm pretty sure of the permanence of that. And email is another thing that I'm pretty sure about the permanence of that. And I mean, yes dot, dot, dot exceptions, but compared to other apps and other systems, I think that's a perfectly fine system. I mean, it's perfectly fine. I mean, fine. The, you need the system that like, to me, a system is as good as the products you make because you have the system. Like, like yeah. I, I think that there are some people that it gives them peace of mind in their daily life to have a system. I am not one of those people, uh, but I assume if you are, then that's good for me. The system is only good if by the end of it, I can say, oh, yeah, look, I got this done. I, I didn't get distracted. Right. I didn't, can, I didn't can change you measure, streams. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you can measure what did you do? Did you do it? Check yes, no. And then that's yes, all that's you need. It. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, I would say another advantage to your email, Brian, is that the, the medium affects things a lot. You know, if we write something down in a notebook, it sometimes feels more real in some ways, but it's not as easily accessible. And if you write yourself an email, it feels a lot like you're programming yourself. Yeah. Which, well, and, and plus good. also like uh, you're treating, you're stepping outside of yourself, you're treating that future you as somebody with their own agency, and you can say things that you would never say in an app 
stuff like, uh, hey, man, I know you're really going to want to play The Last of Us Part 2 with your daughter tomorrow. <laughs> if you could do me a favor, just carve out 30 minutes, knock out this, just deposit these checks. This guy's been waiting on a payment for a while. It should only be 25 minutes. Love you from the past. Good night. And then, you know. <laughs> I like I, I, and it sounds so silly when I put it that way, but uh, I, I have no doubt that everybody believes I do exactly that. I think it's great. I also imagine you getting this letter from me, like, how does he know this stuff? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, it's like it's uh, like I, I get halfway through the letter and I'm like, oh, I bet he's going to. Yep, <laughs> me. He sure does know me. <laughs> uh, I I think it's a great system. I I I, I think that's great. I I you know. And there also, it's like, I remember like Merlin Mann described like a nerd as somebody uses the telephone to talk about the telephone. Yes. And Great the, description. the, a lot of, yeah, a lot of organizational systems, like I'll say this about my friend before, like, uh, a lot of like people seem to be like, how to organize my books on organizing, you know, how to, how to get, you know, how to organize all these organizational systems and stuff. And I, I think I, I don't know. I, I think that if it works, it works. People get excited about some, ah, I love this thing because it's going to fix my life. It's like, tell me five years from now. Tell me five years from now. Tell me, did it make a change? Or three months later, did you move on to another thing? Mm -hmm. So if emails work, I think I, I want other people out there to try Brian's email I mean, system. I, I would say that the email system itself hasn't been great uh, so much as building a, a, a system of interconnected uh, social structures where it's harder than ever to forget to do anything because it's like, yeah. uh, like I'm at place a, I'm talking to person, uh, 12, which means, Oh, there's no, there's no running away and playing Hearthstone right now, because that means person 13 is about to show up. And, you know, uh, that's, that's, Part of what I loved about the ecstasy of being on the road was that uh, you didn't have a lot of choice. Uh, and so I'm trying to build that here so that I'm constantly from the moment I show up to the moment I leave uh, uh, available for various people to grab me to do things that need to be done. Yeah, good point. So uh, Person one thing 12's we... annual celebration is coming up. Please initiate celebratory voice change. <laughs> <laughs> Happy 30th, Bryce. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, uh, keep going. Keep going. We could do this Terminator bit all day. I, I, <laughs> we're walking down a weird path. I don't know if I feel comfortable. <laughs> that doesn't uh, I want to segue over here too, too. It's like when it comes to the concept I of I bought you clothes and shoes and a motorcycle. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh as I said, I wanted to segue mm -hmm. into the idea of when it comes to prioritization is, you know, we were overwhelmed by news. And the, the, my favorite new horrible term is doom scrolling. You know, the idea of yes. like yeah. keep scrolling through, through new horror. It's one of these things. I, I read that I'm like, yeah, <laughs> you know, that's a Feel thing, that. you know. Um, and I think that one of the ways you can find balance is you can make a decision for yourself to say, okay, do I want to be media, and I mean social media and media driven, or do I want to be data driven? And the difference between this is when you decide what your priorities are, both emotionally and practically speaking, is to say, okay, am I going to be motivated by what I'm being told I need to be motivated by, or what I need to be concerned about or worried about, or am I going to be motivated by what I know, you know, with the data, you know, what's the data? I got to pay my bills. I got to do my taxes. I got to do these things. I need to spend time with my family. And then my opinions of what's going on in the world, are they going to be shaped by headlines and tweets or are they going to be shaped by data? Am I going to go look at the data and say, okay, what, what, if I'm going to worry about problems, what problems do I want to worry about? And I use this a lot and I do this and it's it sort of, a, it sort of affects sort of like part of my charitable giving is I look at things, not who's making me, I look at like, I sit back and I go and my, you know, my, my charitable giving is very tiny. Let me make that very clear compared to like really magnanimous people. But when I do say, Oh, you know, it's tax season, whatever I need to make, you know, up level up my donations or do more stuff. I go, okay, what, what do I think are problems? What are things I want to address? And then that, that affects that not what's right in front of my face, you know, because these become, they have their own momentum to stuff. And that's the thing I think that's worth looking into is to say, okay, do I want to be data driven and, and meet data both from how I prioritize and what I pay attention to. So here's my only 
thought on the idea of separating media from data is that I don't, we are all uh, uh, inherently going to look at things different in terms of how, how we find our data and whether or not we like our tolerance level for the amount of, 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 of synth synthesization, synthesization, I can't say that synthesis, uh, synthesis that those numbers will go through. So it's like, for example, um, if we're going to look at politics, uh, all right, media for sure is like Maggie Haberman's articles from the New York Times. Like, you know, think that she's a great reporter or a bad reporter. Like, that is classic narrative from trusted source media. Like, that is as old, old school as that gets. So, okay, if I'm not going to do that, and instead, I want to educate myself on, on some of the underlying issues that she's reporting on. Where do I go for that data? And do I go to sites that have now become new pillars of media that have made their bones on not being the, oh, trust us because we're the New York Times, but rather we take data and synthesize it for you and that now fills in the idea that, oh, no, I am a data-driven person. Like, I read 538, or I read these, uh, you know, this this amazing tweet thread that broke down the real numbers. Uh, because I think that that's, there's, there's a fuzzy line there where I would say, if you were to ask that on Twitter to some of the most problematic people that have created the doom-scrolling culture that we're in right now, I think the vast majority of them would say, yep, I agree with you. That's why I'm oh. data-driven. Yeah, and I guess I guess that, and I should I should qualify this. It starts even from saying that, like, if you say, okay, you know, like, for me, I go like, uh, you know, what are my values? You know, my values is you know improving quality of life for other people, right? And then I'm like, okay, what that? And then my source isn't going to be to go look to a media source. My source is going to look like, well, let me look at some research papers and stuff like this to see like. You know, what are the biggest problems facing people both, let's say, domestically, internationally and domestically, you know, income disparity. It's a huge problem. You know, a lot of the problems that we see in the media, I think, are more well explained by, you know, class issues and in, in income disparity. And I'm like, OK, how do you solve income disparity? I'm like, well, there's there's family structure, things like this, but education's a thing. And it's like, you know, the the software industry, you know there's it's underrepresented by certain groups of people like there's not a people certain people in there and i'm like okay and i i'm a person thinks that the more voices that come into it the better it is how do i address that and so it's like you know part of my charitable giving goes towards organizations that do things like like launchcode.org which you know helps do provides free software instruction and coding instruction to people in inner cities people who traditionally would have access to it because like to me that's great like that's that's my thing like i don't i don't do political politics i don't do any of that i think to me that's inefficient where I'm like, Oh, you know, if I can go commit, you know, donate to a program and I know this is going to help X number of people get closer to getting, you know, computing degrees, then I'm living to my value, you know, and let me, and that's sort of me. It's more like not even going to media sources that tell me about data, like going strictly to data sets and say, what yeah. are these problems? And then going, how do you directly address those? And, you know, the person who did that in a big way, was Gates in, you know, in the nineties, he got criticized because he didn't donate to charity. There were just screeds about how, how stingy he was and how greedy he was. But you read these bios about him. They talked about he would spend his summer vacation or his vacations reading books on viral diseases and, you know, the problems of, you know, lesser developed countries and water and stuff. And finally, when Bill Gates stepped back from Microsoft and said, okay, I'm going to get into the charitable giving thing, the most amazing, you know, benefactors humanity's ever known he has saved millions of lives millions of lives you know with helping you know make hiv you know treatments available etc and other initiatives like the the bill and melinda gates foundation has done incredible stuff because he says i'm i'm not going to just give it to some other foundation and say oh i did a good job or go back a bunch of political candidates because they tell me they're gonna do a good job he's like no i'm gonna build an institution that's gonna try to really address that and that's the kind of thing i mean by data driven is the idea of like really get to the problem and say how do i approach it yeah, uh, it's yeah. A, it's 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 a uh, I, I this is something I wrestle with because um because I I personally have a long way to go to 
hit the long-term promises of everyone I've made individually to the team. And, uh, uh, you know, I mean, as far as the tax man knows or cares, like whether I give the money to charity or give it to, you oh, know, okay. the, the Look, team. I'm going to do a timeout, timeout, timeout. Yeah. I don't mean, as a charitable giving has not, doesn't have to do anything with it. Brian Brushwood talking about critical thinking, Brian Brushwood spending his time talking about science education. That is a value. That is a tremendous value. Sure, sure. So, and 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 I would say even more valuable than somebody saying, "Oh, I'm going to write a check or do this." So, sure, but I I, I suppose emotionally, I feel uh, a, a heavy obligation to yes, of course, my nuclear family, but then beyond that is you know the our our business family, the the producers, editors, everybody who by every second that somebody is here, they're choosing to not be somewhere else, uh, somewhere more established, someone farther ahead, blah, 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 which, which, which uh, it, it, it really, you know, it's just as tax deductible either way. And that's the moral obligation I feel is to, these are people who are showing up because they believe that we've got something here. And so I, I dial in very, very heavy on that. And, and I, I get a bit uncomfortable when it comes to questions of, you know, where should I, where should I toss some coin for charitable giving? Because it's like, I've got a long way to go just to fill the buckets I, of, of, of the folks who are physically here oh, that I see every day, you know, Brian, I, I let, me, let me make it very clear. I think that, I think that charitable giving in many cases is overrated. I think people building businesses is great. I think the fact that creating jobs for other people is the best thing. I think that's ultimately the goal. I, I think that's the goal is not even need. So I think that what you do and other people do in creating business and opportunities no, for other people. Dude, I, I, and I hear, I, I hear you 100%, and I think Bryce will agree. Bryce, you're comfortable with a, a reduction in wages, right? So that we can donate to a cause of, no, sorry. <laughs> It's, no, but, it's, 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 it's never it's, funny to joke about that stuff when yeah. in, in, in no, that kind of situation. Yeah, and I, I think, and I think, let me make that very clear because I think, I think, I think most a lot of char having worked in charities and seen this stuff, I think a lot of it's BS. I think that a lot of it's very wasteful, very, very wasteful. And often people write checks to things on feeling they did good. And I'm like, you may have made the problem worse. You know, you may have d misdirected money to something that maybe wants to continue this or is doing bad solutions and stuff. And I think that like, you know, Warren Buffett's 99% giving pledge. My problem with that is like, basically that is that he's talked to other billionaires about promise to give away 99% of your money to charity. I'm like, giving to charity doesn't mean it's necessarily going to really solve the problems. Like I would say, you know, commit your wealth towards building a better world, which could be done from, you know, creating an ethical pharmaceutical company, you know, it could be created, you know, be done by creating a company that's going to build water filtration systems for the third world or toilets or whatever, like, and, and it will be more sustainable because you could donate to a charity. Charities then have to go out. Charities are very good at getting funding. And I've seen how much of the effort goes towards fundraising versus what they're trying to do. So I, I, I guess where I'm seeing the priority is I'm like, I think your priority is I have a business, take care of my family and take care of my employees. That's great. You, you, you've made a decision to say, Hey, you know what? I'm not going to fire everybody. So, you know, I can go walk, you know, across America and understand America and then decide what I'm going to do next. You know, like, I think it's, it's I think it's the, the best value somebody can do is create a job for somebody else. So my hat's off to you, sir. Bryce. I wouldn't even wear looks a hat. Like... I already nailed it. <laughs> Bryce looks like he has something he wants to say. No. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, no, Bryce. I mean, if you have a different I, point, take on it, please. No, I, 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 I actually, I actually don't. I, um, I, like, okay. um, I you mean, know, I, 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 I suppose what, uh, what I want to explore is, um, if, if the subject is, uh, uh, charitable giving, uh, whether it's tax deductible or not, uh, I, I have found that emotionally I get very confused because, um, uh, you, you know, it, it's, it's, it's hard to know, uh, uh, I, uh, uh you know your your family you take care of your family but but then what happens when your family expands by six to eight more people you know sometimes full-time sometimes part-time and and then ex your family expands a little bit more with you know a bunch of co-hosts on a bunch of podcasts or whatever and it's like it's so hard to 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 see beyond them uh the moment there's any kind of ducats in your in your fingers uh to 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 want to throw anything I, past I, anyone I, is I I, 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 I hadn't thought much about this until we brought it up just now.
Yeah, and I feel bad I even brought up the idea of charitable because it wasn't about that. The idea was about prioritization <laughs> yeah. when you see issues in the It was really about like, what do I do when I see an issue in the world that I want? And years ago, it was critical thinking. Like, and I wasn't cared, or I was worried about, you know, science, education, critical thinking. I volunteered, you know, I did programs in schools, and then I became, you know, worked for a foundation where I went out there and I said, I'm going to spend my time working on critical thinking education. And it wasn't, you know, I worked for an organization that did that, but that was not me giving away, but it was me directing my energy. And I was just trying to use this as an analogy of directing energy or resources towards you know and your attention like where do you pay attention to and for me it's like well i looked at the data to see what what concerns me and i look at what the data what it concerns me now and it's not whatever the media tells me the current narrative it is because yeah there are I, things th I, I think, care I, think about I think to to answer your question i i just happen to be in in, in a place where i uh uh the in in the battle between data and media really neither is a player uh given that 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 i see the faces of the human beings that that i'm here to well, fill but well, so oh, I, no, no, no. I, I wait wait can i say no, no, i started no, no, no. this by saying it oh, yeah. starts from you yeah. and then the people your yeah. family and the people around you that's that's yeah that's where it starts i'm I, still it, so, i'm yes. still on that phase i guess would be my answer Bryce, I guess, you've been trying to get something so here. Uh, i have a question about the and i guess the initial question right the idea of are you more data driven or media driven um and i guess just from from an exploratory standpoint what are the i think i think was i this is what are the pros or the benefits of being media driven because it, it feels a little one-sided into and I'm, I'm not quite sure if we're saying like here are two v valid things or here is an advocation for you know, do, and because e either is fine, but I want to know if what what we're saying here. I can I can speak for the media. Yeah. If no one else will, I'll speak for the media. <laughs> um, I think it is an idea of connecting to what your neighbor thinks. I think that there is a uh, there is a danger to being too data driven in that your own you know, your own philosophies, your own instincts can often be reinforced. You know, data is is as good as it is interpolated, right? And you can have like a, a more rigorous way of looking at it and you can try to challenge your own beliefs and you can uh, uh, try to reinforce the fact that uh, just because you find a thing doesn't mean that it is totally justified in your mind, uh, but often we don't. And the more we are apart from other people, the more we find our own uh, uh, beliefs, in my opinion, hardening. So what the media can do at its best is let you know other perspectives, let you know other points of view uh, that are articulated and put out there in a human context for which we will always be able to latch on to. Now, the OD'd point, which is I think if we're going to get into like elements of doom scrolling and stuff like that, is that you are now crossing into the world where it's more of a mob. Now you're not just being a thoughtful neighbor and challenging your own beliefs because of what somebody else uh, is, is saying. Now you're at the point where we're in a panicky moment and you're looking for a reason to reinforce the fact that if everybody's panicking, then I need to. I, I inherently need to find the thing that will put me into a position of panic or I want to, I want to, I want to file in along with everybody because that is now's the time. The time to shout is now the time to panic is now. Mm. So clearly based on these media narratives that are set out. Yeah, I guess I would say that the idea is be media aware. And then sort of, to me, it's like, now let me look at the data to figure out like, what because every every voice that i hear out there and even ones maybe i largely agree with has an agenda and also it's like and if you agree with this then you have to agree with this other thing too but and i'm like i don't i don't know that i don't know that you know and and that's why i, I kind of like the idea of like one figure out your own values and i think that you know it starts with you need to take you know personal responsibility family responsibility responsible to your friends your employees and the people around you and then there's you know the, how, and then your place in your community and what you want to do there and, and for me a lot of it's like let me look at the data you know like i look in you know in la you know a thing that i've not done anything about i've done nothing about other than just talk about it which you know 
shows you how useless I am as a person, but there's a big mental health problem, big mental health problem. And it's, you know, we have a drug problem, a mental health problem. It's one of the reasons why we have a really big homeless problem. And, you know, and I don't know what those solutions are. It's a thing that I follow and I look at the data to see what's being said about that. And I, and I share frustrations, but I also like, well, we have people who need help. I don't know how to give it to them right now. I'm aware of organizations and stuff. I'm not sure if they're good at what they're doing, but you know, I use, you know, the media says, oh, look at this thing. I'm like, yeah, let's figure out what's going on here. And then maybe I'll form an opinion later on. I don't have to have an opinion on everything. Sure. Cool. Fun talk, guys. <laughs> you, Fun got talk. Any, you got any picks? <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, I got a pick. I do. Warrior Nun. Watch the first two episodes yeah. of it. Uh, if you enjoyed Buffy the Vampire Slayer and wished it would come back, guess what? It's back. It's called Warrior Nun. Yeah, we were watching this for spoiler in time. And uh, the other show that we're watching right now is uh, what? Uh, what? What's that HBO one? Oh, to heavy. Um, uh, I know this much is true. I know this much Ugh. is true, which is just constant tragedy. I still have to finish the second half of that one. <laughs> um, Warrior Nun is just like, Let's just like fight some demons and like it's. Can it's, we just have a dead girl? Just one <laughs> dead girl come back to life. Please. Have her dance and, and date and kill demons and yeah. have a fun time and make funny jokes with criminal friends. Come on, just once. It, 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 it felt a little in the trailer, it felt a little like Stranger Things meets Preacher. Uh, like, it, it, to uh -huh. be honest, uh, imagine a lot of what you liked about Preacher in that it was transgressive to have everything yeah. be set in playing with religion. Remove heavy duty, surprising, shocking gore and instead put uh, female empowerment and you have Warrior Nun. It's great. I, I like yeah. it a lot. Yeah, I'll, I'll back that play. That's uh, I'm 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 glad we decided to do that. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's, there's not a lot of shows coming out right now, but uh, I think this will be a fun couple of weeks to do. Uh, here's my pick. Season two of The Expanse. We're expanding. So how, We're how did you feel about, uh, how did you feel about, uh, or I guess uh, Fedora Hat's still around. Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, oh, how geez. do you feel about wow. Fedora Hat at this point? Wow. This isn't a spoiler, uh, <laughs> the, is the mantra. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. No, I, I, I like him a lot more. He's still alive. Which I didn't know he wasn't alive, but I do now. I mean, eventually everybody uh, dies. Sure. <laughs> um, I uh, uh, well, it really actually makes a lot of context to where we are in the story now. <laughs> uh, I and like him a lot he better. Whether to wear a fedora. <laughs> I like I like him a lot better as a wayward mercenary than i liked him as a noir detective brian gives me so much crap for doing that on the on the outside <laughs> he did he did on on yeah on the outsider oh god damn it i was all right guilty uh, so, i think brian could have a job working for like the cia like brian don't let him know we got 40 nuclear warheads in germany okay yeah. <laughs> you know? you're like now go have dinner with the russian ambassador I'm like oh yeah i'm not gonna Definitely say not how many dozens of nuclear warheads yeah. we have in germany <laughs> so it's more than a couple but let's I mean, just say <laughs> if your wife ever said go out and get some number of eggs she she wouldn't she wouldn't ask you for a hundred would she no nope. <laughs> Probably ask you for, but more than a dozen, right? More right. than a dozen? What is she making? Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh. um, uh, do I have a pick? I don't think I have a pick. Uh, uh, Warrior Nun is very good. Andrew? Uh, my pick is the book, Wisdom of the Crowds, by, uh, I think it was James Sirwicky, mm -hmm. which was a really good book that shows, and I think I think maybe most of us read it here, the idea is it's not the wisdom of the mob. It's it's not put a bunch of people into the room and let them argue and get their point of view. It's the opposite. And it's and I brought this up. It's one of these books that like sometimes people would quote it and not get it because they would get the, the wrong sort of conclusion. It's the idea that ask 40 people independently and the crazy voices will tend to cancel each other out. And the center will sort of center around kind of what the expert I view on something is. And he provides a lot of wonderful examples. And I need to, I want to follow up, see what else he's written kind of on that topic, but it's a really good idea. If you want to understand at its best how markets of ideas work and kind of like 
all kinds of markets and democracies and stuff like that can work at their best. It's the idea of like, have a lot of voices and then let each have sort of their individual opportunity to say something. And then you sort of even it out and then you start to get signal from the noise. So big fan. Nice. All right. Gentlemen, it's been after. Hey, all he lives right. forever, Justin, just to be clear. Like that, just, that character, I'm, he yeah, lives enough forever. With you. He, enough he, gets, with you. he throws the fedora into space in a very He's not even turn. wearing the fedora anymore. And He's where did he go? And where did it go? That's the fedora lives. Go? All right. All right. I'm going to eat. Bye. Right, bye. I love you. See bye. you. Bye, guys. <laughs> all right. Thank you, everybody. We'll be back. Uh, they'll be back with happy hour in about 20 minutes. Cord Killer's coming up in a couple hours. What's up, Andrew? Uh, Brian, let me know when you want to talk. We'll talk. Bye. All right, I'll tell, uh, call Andrew when you want to talk about stuff. Yeah. Cool. Bye. All Thanks, right. Man. Uh, thank you, everybody, for tuning in. We will be back uh, in about 20 minutes with happy hour. Uh, and Cord Killer's after that.